Toni Morrison seems always to be in two worlds. There is the visible world bustling around her, and there is the world of her novels, whose characters tell us about an interior reality hidden from the eyes of strangers. In her five books, she has transported millions of readers into the experience of being black in America. The Bluest Eye. Sula. Song of Solomon. Tar Baby. In Beloved, perhaps the most painful and beautiful of her creations, Toni Morrison reached back into the 19th century years of slavery. Her writing has won numerous awards, including the National Book Critics Circle Award for Song of Solomon in 1978 and the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved in 1988. Fifteen universities have awarded her honorary degrees. Like many fiction writers, Morrison has earned a living by other means. She was an editor for Random House and taught at Howard University, Yale, and the State University of New York at Albany. She is now teaching in the humanities at Princeton University. She is also a trustee at the New York Public Library, where we talked about how the invented world of fiction connects to life as it is. There is such a gulf between the, quote, inner city today and the rest of the country, in both imagination and reality and politics and, and literature, frankly, very little... Very little communication takes place. If you were writing for the rest of the country about the inner city today, what metaphor would you, you use? And I ask that question because you struck a common metaphor in Song of Solomon. The metaphor there was flying, everybody's dream of literally being up and away in the air. Every, all of us could identify with that. But what, if you were writing for the rest of the country, would you use as a metaphor for the inner city today? Love. We have to embrace, we have to embrace ourselves. Uh, Self-regard. I remember James Baldwin said once, you've already been bought and paid for. Your ancestors already gave it up for you. It's already done. You don't have to do that anymore. Now you can love yourself. It's already possible. So I had this feeling of, admiration and respect and love for these black people in the inner city who are intervening, who are going in and saying, you four girls, you come to my house every Thursday and we're going to eat and we're going to take you out. I mean, these are professional women, we'll say, who go in, have these companions. I love those men I heard about in Chicago, black professional men who went every lunch hour to the playgrounds in Chicago South Side to talk to those children, not to be authoritarian, but just to get to know them without the bureaucracy, without the agencies, to simply become an agency. The love you're talking about is the love inspired by moral imagination that takes us beyond blood. Absolutely. Absolutely that. But the image one has, and as a reporter, I've been there, that in so many of these neighborhoods, that simply isn't possible because yeah. of the wasted That's terrible. nature. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It reminds you of some nightmare that the Marquis de Sade thought up in some of those places. But the children, I call them children when they're under 18, uh, are hungry for that love. The drugs are just asleep that you can't even wake up from because you might remember what you did when you were there. There's no place. And there should be a rehabilitation center on every corner along with McDonald's and the banks. This is serious business. The waiting lists are incredible. I mean, it's... It's terrible. It's really terrible. But some... Interesting things have happened along that line. Some woman told me a couple of weeks ago, a close friend of mine, that men, black men, were going into shelters, I think. They were spending time holding crack babies. I mean, children that were born, holding them. Holding them. Now, I'm sure it does something for the baby, but think what it does for that man. To actually give up some time and hold a baby. I remember that John Leonard once said, uh, Tony Morrison writes about places where even love found its way with an ice pick. 
Maybe that's the subject. Let's, can we talk about love for a moment? You say love sure. is the metaphor. And, and when I go back through the novels, love is there in so many different ways and forms that, that particularly when I look at the women in your novels, at the thing, at the extraordinary things they do for love. There's the grandmother who has her leg amputated so that she can have an insurance policy that will buy a house and, and take care of her children as they grow up. There's Seti who, who is willing to kill her children before the slave catchers can come mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and seize them. Mm -hmm. What kind of love is that? <laughs> Some of it's very fierce, powerful, distorted, even because the duress they work under is so overwhelming. But I think they, believed as I do. It may be true that, you know, people say, I didn't ask to be born. I think we did. And that's why we're here. We are here and we have to do something nurturing that we respect before we go. We must. It is more interesting, more complicated, more intellectually demanding and more morally demanding to love somebody, to take care of somebody, to make one other person feel good. Now the dangers of that are the dangers of setting oneself up as a martyr or as, you know, the one who, without whom it will not be done. Paul D. says to Seti, your love is too thick. It's too thick. Is that what you're talking about? Right. It can get to be very excessive. And what, how, how do we know when the love is too thick? We don't. We really don't. That's a big problem. We don't know when to stop, as Baby Suck says. When is it too much and when is it not, not enough? That is the problem of the human mind and the soul. But we have to try that. We have to try that. We have to do that. And not doing it is so poor for the self. It's so poor for the mind. It's so uninteresting to live without that. And it has no risk. There's no risk involved. And that just seems to make life not just livable, but a, a gallant, gallant event. But I have a sense in so many of the love stories in your novels of, that, that, that the world is destined to doom love or that love is destined to be doomed by the world. Oh, in the stories, the characters are placed by me on a cliff. I mean, I sort of push them as far as I can to see of what they are made. I don't think I've ever met a more pathetic creature in, in contemporary literature than uh, uh, Pecola Breedlove in The, the Bluest Eye, yeah. the little girl who wants the blue eyes, you know, abused by her uh, uh, parents, uh, re rejected by her neighbors, uh, <laughs> ugly, homely, alone, finally descending in, into madness. I, I, it's been years since I read that novel, but I remember her. She but she surrendered completely to the so-called master narrative. To? The master narrative. I mean, the whole notion of what is ugliness, what is worthlessness, what is content. She got it from her family. She got it from school. She got it from the movie. She got it everywhere. The She's master a, narrative. What is That's life. No. It's uh, white male life. <laughs> The master narrative is whatever ideological script that is being imposed by the people in authority on everybody else. The master fiction, uh, history, it has a certain point of view. So when her, when these little girls see that the most prized gift that they can get at Christmas time is this little white doll, that's the master narrative speaking. This is beautiful, this is lovely, and you're not it. So what are you going to do? <laughs> so if you've surrendered to that, as Piccola did, the little girl, the eye of the story is sort of a bridge there. They're sort of resistant, a little feisty about it. They don't trust any adults. She is so needful, so completely needful, has so little, needs so much. She becomes the perfect victim, the total, you know, pathetic one. And for her, there is no way back into the community and in society. For her, as an abused child, she can only escape into fantasy and to madness, which is part of what the mind is 
always creative. You can think that up. What about uh, Ella in Beloved who said, if uh, anybody <laughs> was to ask me, I'd say, don't love don't nothing. Don't love nothing. <laughs> I've heard that said a lot. Don't love nothing. Save it. You see, that was the one of the devastating things, I think, in the experience of black people in this country, was a, the effort to prevent that, the full expression of their love. And that sentiment that Ella has is conservative. If you were, if you want to hang on to your sanity or hang on to yourself, don't love anything. It'll hurt. And of course, that's true, not just of African Americans, it's true of all sorts of people. It's so risky. People don't want to get hurt. They don't want to be left. They don't want to be abandoned, you see. It's as though love is always so present, you're giving somebody else. And it's really a present you're giving yourself. On the other hand, there, there's Pilot, your character, who reminds me of my, uh, my Aunt Mildred, who says in Song of Solomon, I wish I'd known more people. I would have loved them all. If I'd have known more, yeah. I would have loved more. Yes. There are people like that, too. Not all of your characters are driven by no, dark. No, but that's fantasy. a totally generous, free woman. Fearless. She's not afraid of anything. She has a few little things. She has a little vaguely uh, supportive skill that she can perform. She doesn't run anybody's life. She's available for almost infinite love. Almost infinite. If you need her, she'll deliver. And complete clarity about who she is. Complete Do you know clarity. people like that? Yes. And my family. Women who presented themselves to me that way. They were just absolutely clear. And absolutely reliable. And they had this sort of intimate relationship with God and death and all sorts of things that strike fear into the modern heart. They had a language for it. And they had a I don't know, a blessedness maybe, but they seem not to be fearful. It's to those women, you know, that I really feel an enormous responsibility. Whenever I answer questions such as the ones you put to me and about how terrible it all is and <laughs> how it's all going down the drain, I think about my great-grandmother and her daughter and her daughter and all those women who had, I mean, Incredible things happened to those people. They never knew from one day to the next about anything. But they believed in their dignity, that they were people of value, that they had to pass that on, and they did it so that when I confront these sort of little 20th century problems, what could it be? <laughs> these sort of little 20th century problems? But you seem to have defined one of them quite interestingly, the... The conflict of identity between Nell yeah. and, and Sula. Sula. Nell Sula. Yeah. gives herself to the community, yeah. needs the security, yeah. the comfort, the yeah. conformity yeah. of it. And Sula comes along, as, as you Disruptive, said. Disruptive, yeah. yeah. She's out there independent, mm -hmm. self uh, uncontained and uncontainable, mm -hmm. you said. Uh, you call her the new black woman, the new world black woman. New world, yeah. Why? Well, she's uh, experimental. She's sort of an outlaw. I mean, you know, she's not gonna take it anymore. I mean, she's at the, she's available to her own imagination. She's available to her own imagination. And other people's stories, other people's definitions are not hers. The interesting thing about Sula is that she makes you do your own defining for yourself. Yeah. So I was putting together two sort of strands of uh, womanhood, certainly black womanhood. It's a a nurturing uh, block neighborhood woman who relies on that, but without the imagination of the new world. And then Sula, who doesn't have the other roots, has no seed around which to grow. I happen to think that they need each other. I mean, that the new world black woman needs a little of the old world black woman in her and the other way around. I don't think that they are completely fulfilled without the other. I think an ideal situation is a Sula who has some responsibilities and takes them upon herself, but at the same time has this, you know, flair. I don't like those either-or yeah. scenarios where you, you do this and you can't do that. I think one of the interesting things that certainly feminine intelligence can bring is a kind of a look at the world as though you can do two things or three things or be, uh, the personality is more fluid, uh, more receptive. The boundaries are not quite <laughs> so defined, and I think that's 
part of what modernism is. Mm, really. The creation of a of a new kind of person who, like Nell, is is committed to yeah, nurture and caring, sure. but like Sula, uh, yeah. is defined of the master narrative. That's I mean, right. she she won't let it write her script for yeah. her. She writes her own rules That's so it. that she can defy them. Exactly. There's a combination there that we hope emerges. Yeah. If you see, you know, if it happens, and I think I've seen women who strike me as being like that. Uh, you've had guests on your program who look like that, women who are very independent, very fierce, artist women, black women, who at the same time, you know, can cook and sew and nurture and manage and so on. And I think that we're probably in a very good position to do that as black women. I mean, we're managing households and other people's children and two jobs and listening to everybody's and at the same time creating, singing, holding, bearing, transferring the culture for generations. And we've been walking on water for 400 years. So now there's the 20th century. We don't have to jettison that like, say, Jadine and Tar Baby and go off and totally westernize and Europeanize oneself, nor do we have to be her aunt, Aunt Dean. There's something in between. There's something in between. And that's what's really attractive and challenging. And since you can feel both worlds sort of pressing on one, it's, a, it's an ideal space for African-American women to inhabit. Have these women you have created taught you anything? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, it is the lesson. All the books are questions for me. I mean, they start out because I write them because I don't know something. I don't, I want to know what does that feel like, that color thing, that in the bluest eye, what does that feel like to really feel that worthlessness? And the same thing was true with Sula and Song of Solomon. To all of them was there was something in there I really did not understand. I really didn't know. Uh, what is the problem between a pair of lovers who really love one another but have culturally different. I mean, is that what that battle is about? Culture and class in Tar Baby when Son and J.D. can't speak to one another. They're all sort of right, but nobody will give. Nobody will say, okay, I'll give you this little bit. What have they learned? Uh, how can you manage to no love another person under these circumstances if your culture, your class, your education is that different? You know, where is the ground? And I, all the while I wrote that book, I was so eager for them to make it, <laughs> you know, sort of end up and get married and go to the seashore. And yet? They didn't. They all had, they had to learn something else, I think, before that would happen. And with Beloved, oh, I, I began to think about really motherhood. And, you know, it's not the all-encompassing role for women now. It can be a secondary role or you don't have to choose it. But on the other hand, there was something so valuable about what happens when one becomes a mother. For me, it was the most liberating thing that ever happened to me, having children. Liberating? Oh. Most, most of the cliches say, well, you... You're immediately imprisoned by the love that you want to give, but you are a hostage to that love and to those small children and to their lives. You you now define yourself like whites and blacks used to do with each other by children. They are you're limiting yourself. Did you say liberating? Liberating. Because of the demands that the children make are not the demands of a normal other. The children's demands on me were things that nobody else ever asked me to do. Such as? Uh <laughs> Be a good manager, have a sense of humor, deliver something that somebody could use. And they were not interested in all the things that other people were interested in, like what I was wearing or, you know, if I was sensual or if I was, you know, all of that went by. You've seen those eyes of those children? They don't want to hear it. They want to know, what are you going to do now, <laughs> today? And somehow all of the baggage that I had accumulated as a person about what was valuable, so much of that just fell away. And I could not only be me, whatever that was, somebody actually needed me to be that. It's different from being a daughter. You know, you figure out how to do that. Or it's different from being a sister. Those children, if you listen to them, 
look at them. They make demands that you can live up to, not you can't. Because they don't need all that overwhelming love either. I mean, that's just you being vain about it. If you listen to them, somehow you are able to free yourself from baggage and vanity and all sorts of things and deliver a better self, one that you like. The person that was in me that I liked best was the one my children seemed to want. That one. The one when they walked in the room, do you frown at the children and say, pull your socks up? Or is their presence, you know? Also, you can begin to see the world through their eyes again, which are your eyes. I found it extraordinary. It is true that it is physically confined. You can't go anywhere. I mean, you, you have to be there. <laughs> you raised them by yourself, didn't you? Yes. Would you have liked to have had the help of a companion? Yes. It would just have been somebody else to think that through for you. Yeah, it would have been nice. The more, the merrier. <laughs> I needed a lot of help. As I listen to you talk about the liberation of motherhood and love, I find all the more incredible said his willingness to kill her son in, oh, ra yeah. rather than let the slave catcher kidnap him. Was that a far out figment of your imagination to make a dramatic point or did you find in your research into the past that there were mothers willing to do that? Well, that was Margaret Garner's story. There was a slave woman in Cincinnati named Margaret Garner who escaped from Kentucky, arrived in Cincinnati with her mother-in-law. The situation was a little different. I think she came with four others. And uh, right after she got there, the man who owned her found her. And she ran out into the shed and tried to kill all her children, just like that. And she uh, was about to bang one's head up against the wall when they stopped her. Now, she um, became a cause celebre for the abolitionists because, you see, they were trying to improve situation a little bit and try to get her tried for murder. Because that would have been a big coup if they had gotten her tried for murder because it would assume that she had some responsibility over those children. But they were not successful. She was tried for the real crime which was stolen property and convicted and returned to the same man. But what struck me, because I didn't want to know a great deal about her story, because it would be those space for me to invent, was that when they interviewed her, she was not a mad dog killer. She was this very calm, in her 20s woman. And all she said was, they will not live like that. They will not live like that. And her mother-in-law, who was a preacher, said, I watched her do it, and I neither encouraged her nor discouraged her. So for them, it was a dilemma. This is a real dilemma. Shall I permit my children, who are my best thing, to live like I have lived, and I know that's terrible, or to take them out? So she decided to kill them and kill herself. And that was noble. That was the identification. She was saying, I'm a human being. These are my children. This script I am writing. Could you have put your, did you ever put yourself in her position? In asked, the writing of the book, yeah. Could I have done that to I my two it, sons? I ask it a lot. As a matter of fact, the reason the character Beloved enters is because I couldn't answer it. I felt just like baby Suggs. I didn't know whether I would do it or not. You hear stories of that in slavery and Holocaust situations. I mean, where women yeah. have got to figure it out fast. I mean, really fast. So the only person I felt who had the right to ask her that question was the child she yeah. killed. And she can ask her, what did you do that for? Who are you talking about? This is better. What do you know? You know, because I just, it was for me an impossible decision. Someone gave me. Uh, the line for it at one time, which I have found useful, is that it was the right thing to do, but she had no right to do it. And you've never answered it in your own case. Could I do it? I've asked. I don't know. You said in your lecture at the University of Michigan that it's a, a great relief to you 
that terms like white and race are now discussable in literature. How so? Because a language had been developed and has still some sovereignty in which we mean white and we mean black or we mean ethnic, but we say something else. And so there's an enormous amount of confusion. It's difficult even to understand the literature of the country if you can't say white and you can't say black and you can't say race. One of the things I was doing in that speech uh, was using some of the uh, scholarship that uh, other Africanist scholars had uh, already done in order to say, at last, we can look clearly, for example, at Herman Melville, uh, at Edgar Allan Poe, uh, at Willa Cather, at uh, real issues that were affecting founding as well as 20th century American writers, because now it's not incoherent, because we can talk about it now. We don't have to call it nature, or we don't have to call it um, radical political. We can say what it was, and that is a relief. Uh, the public rhetoric has been filled with race and white and black, and so that it seems a surprise to you someone say, well, now at least we can discuss those in literature. You're saying that they weren't a part of uh -huh. our tradition oh, no. of storytelling, oh, no. novels? Not in the critique, not in the discourse, not in the reviews, not in the scholarship around these works. That was not uh, a subject to be discussed. It was not worthy of discussion. Not only that, it admitted that the master narrative could not encompass all these things. The silence was absolutely important. The silence of the, of the um, black person. The silence, you mean that his voice, his her presence, voice was never heard? Never yeah. heard, and that they don't speak in the texts themselves. They are not permitted to say things. So that the, the academy or the history can't really permit them to be center stage in the discourse of the text, in art, in literature. Um, but in public discourse, when we talk about neighborhoods or policy or schools or welfare or practically anything, the real subject is race or is class. I mean, that's what it's about. We may call it disadvantaged or undeveloped or remedial or, you know, all these sort of euphemisms for poor people and or black people and or any non-white person in this country. That is the subject of practically all of the political discourse there is. But it has been kept out of the art world. Um, there is a wonderful collection of paintings, the image of the black in the Western world. Um, no one thinks of Hogarth, for example, as having painted all these black people. Uh, no one thinks of... Uh, of uh, all of the importance, the changes that the iconography of black people went through. They're everywhere. The country, particularly this one, is seething with the presence of black people. But there had, it was necessary to deny in critical language that presence when we discussed it. I read all those books in graduate school as everybody did. We never talked about what was really going on. Uh, we talk about Huck Finn and Jim, and we think about how wonderful uh, the innocence of this sort of radical child is, uh, kind of a paradigm for the American as he comes of age, his the generosity, white the white American, because it is about the construction of a white male. But what's serviceable to him, to Huck, is this grown-up black man who was never called a man, um, who is the battle plane or the arena through which Huck can become a moral person. He becomes a moral person because of his association with this black man who is never called a man. And to Mark Train's credit, he provides an extraordinary scene where you realize that Jim has a wife and has a child, and he's trying to get home. 
Huck's trying to get to territory. He's trying to get home. And a terrible little thing happened at that moment when he told his daughter to shut the door and she didn't do it. And he told her again and she didn't do it. And he got annoyed and he hit her. And then later realized that she was sick. She had spinal meningitis or something. And she had lost her hearing. And he's reflecting on that. And he tells that story to Huck. And suddenly there's this man who has a context. He has a family. He has, he has a family. Emotions. Like... Emotions. And it's an overwhelming thing for Huck, who can say, interestingly enough, these people think about children the same way we do. So it's a revelation. You were, you were saying earlier, before when we were talking before we began uh, the conversation, that, that in the movie Glory, <laughs> the only reference that is made to the fact that these black troopers have... A family is once when they're being paid. Exactly. And they say, we need the money. I mean, I have a family. But those men are fighting uh, and dying and willing to die for a very important cause, freedom. But it's never contextualized. They are not seen as having children, wives, aunts, mothers. They are a blasted family that doesn't matter, for whom they are perceived of as not feeling responsibility and who are not responsible to them. And it's so absolutely contrary to the real life of black people for whom the family and the relations are of paramount importance. There is no life outside the family for the traditional black you know, person. The artist is supposed to carry our, our moral imagination. It's astonishing to me that in the 1840s and 50s, on the eve of the Civil War, in the period of traumatic uh, mm -hmm. conflict over abolition and mm -hmm. slavery, mm -hmm. that uh, the American novelists were not dealing with, <laughs> with, with, with those issues. Hawthorne was writing European Gothic uh, with ruins and, uh, yeah. and, and, and ghosts, mm -hmm. the supernatural. James Fenimore Cooper was writing bestsellers mm -hmm. set in primeval mm -hmm. forest. The mm -hmm. best-selling novels, in fact, uh, on the eve of the Civil War were written, were soppy stories mm -hmm. written by women about mm -hmm. courageous mm -hmm. orphans. <laughs> Your people never show up in the, in the novels of that time. How do you explain that? Well, they do. They show up. They're everywhere. They're in Hawthorne's power of blackness. They're in all the dark symbols. They're in the haunting. What's he haunted by? What is the guilt? What is that real sin that is really worrying Hawthorne all his life? They're there. You think it's it all was? all in Fenimore Cooper. I think it was. I don't care where he took the story. Novelists, writers are informed by the major currents of the world. It's in Melville. It's everywhere in Poe. But blacks don't emerge as people with oh, no, 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 no. contact no, with not story, with family, oh, no. with oh, no. emotions. No. no. The characters are discredited and ridiculed and um, perjured. But the idea of those characters, the construction of them as an outside representation of anarchy, collapse, illicit sexuality, all of these negative things that, are, uh, that they feared are projected onto this presence so that you find these extraordinary gaps and evasions and destabilizations. The chances of getting a truly complex human black person in a book in this country in the 19th century was unlikely. Melville came probably very close with, you know, sorts of classic complexities, but not real flesh and blood people. Yeah, there were symbols, I Symbols there more. Were, yeah, so complicated shadows symbols. Shadows on but, the wall back right. there, at the rear of his cave. But he gets into bed with him. In the very first scene, Ishmael goes to bed with Quigley. Each one of those white people in Moby Dick has a black brother. They're paired together. Fadala is the shadow of Ahab. Queequeg is the shadow of Ishmael. They all have them. And they work together in tandem all through the book. So that what I am saying is that even though 
The realistic representation is not there. The sympathetic one you get sort of in, if you can call it, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin. But the information, subtextual information, it is powerful what they are saying. It's all self-reflexive. It's all about the fabrication of a white male American. Isn't that tension the fate of this American experience? I mean, from the beginning, when blacks were the unacknowledged presence mm -hmm. at Philadelphia when mm -hmm. the Constitution was being written, <laughs> exactly. in the constant, uh, you, well, I think your term for it is unspeakable Things unspoken. Unspeakable things unspoken. Always we are defining ourselves by exactly. the other. Even when it is not spoken, this deep and psychic struggle going on exactly. to, to, to see and not see the other. That's right. And it can become truly pathological, truly crazy. In what sense? Well, when you think about the instruction one needs to become a racist, or the instruction one receives to become the victim of racism, it's truly debilitating. I don't mean it's vaguely unsettling. I mean it is, I think it's, it can get to be of clinical proportions. It can, it's, it's as though you... Requiring the surgery of a civil war to exactly. attempt to extricate this. And what it does on a personal level is you, if someone says to me, you know, this hand is not your hand. It doesn't belong to you. It's on your body, but it's alien. And I'm convinced. So what I do is it folds up, right? It atrophies. And I have to figure out something to do with it. It's a true severance of part of myself. It's a true severance of the body politic. You know, racism is not old. I mean, it seems to have been around forever, but say a thousand years? The human race is what, four million years old? It's not a fixed star. The interesting thing is slavery is older than racism. Of course. Yeah. This is why there's a double bind in this country, because you had the twin evils of slavery, which, I don't know, everybody knew something about, everybody's ancestors knew something about that. But you have the visible other who cannot disappear, who cannot, quote, pass, who cannot melt. So wherever he is, he is the icon and he is the reminder, not only of slavery, not only of degradation, not only of dishonor, but the associations that are racial. And that persists. That persists. And you say that it deeply infected the literature of, oh, sure. of escapism in a sense in the in the in, in the nineteenth century when these gifted men and they did produce a wonderful body of sure. work were writing wonderfully romantic. I don't mean uh, Harlequin novels. No, but, but uh, they were out there in the imagination uh, where you weren't. No, there was an Eden, and what you needed yeah. for that Eden was for it to not be susceptible to uh, corruption, it can't fall. Uh, America was, you know, this Eden for everyone. It was uh, beautiful and perceived, uh, although it wasn't as uninhabited. I was reading something in Bernard Balin and it said he uh, bought this, this land, uh, was perceived of as being this large, uninhabited tract surrounded by tribes of savages. <laughs> so what do you mean you have this uninhabited <laughs> land? A <laughs> void. A void, right? <laughs> exactly. So that, of course, they had to fill. And when they came, you know, they were, you know, dreamers. And, uh, what one has to remember, I think, over and over again, is what they were running from. Which was? Poverty, humiliation, jail, prostitution. I mean, some of them were nice clerks and so on, but they were, some of them were not even running to freedom. They were running from it. I mean, the license that the Puritans understood is corrupt. They were trying to get it over here so they could be disciplined and, and contained. Georgia, like Australia, was settled by, uh, they won't like this down in Georgia, but the fact that history is the fact, was settled by debtors and, and, oh, sure. and ex-prisoners yes. and, uh, and yeah. criminals getting a second That's start right. over here. Now, it could have happened um, that all those people who came here figured it all out. Um, and eventually, slavery was of no use economically, perhaps. Uh, but to make an American, you had to have 
all of these people from these different classes, different countries, different languages, feel close to one another. So what does an Italian peasant have to say to a German burger? And what does an Irish uh, peasant have to say to a Latvian? You know, really, they tended to balkanize. Mm. But what they could all do is not be black. So it is not coincidental that the second thing every immigrant learns when he gets off the boat is that word, nigger. In that way, he's establishing oneness, solidarity, and union with the country. That is the marker. That's the one. What kind of need did that meet in the psyche, do you think? Well, these were people who were frightened. I mean, you, I would be. You go to a strange country, maybe you have some friends there, you need a job, you've cut your bridges, you said something's terrible back home, you go and you immigrate, you go someplace else. And if it's under duress, you're facing chaos. And when you're facing a chaos, you have to name it, or violate it, or control it in some way. So you want to belong to this large idea. You want to belong. And one is, one learns very quickly what to belong to. And you belong to this non-black population who is, is everywhere. But it serves, it serves, uh, a, it has always served economically a lot of forces in this country. That I can understand, but the failure of, of the writer to deal, to cross the boundary, to incorporate the other into the novel is one that I, I don't understand. Although I, I don't want to run the risk of, of trying to read into the past the no, mores and visions and insights of the moment. Of the 20th century. Now. But I think many of them did. I think that book by Willa Cather, although she, it's late, it's sort of 1938, 39, 40, but still her life, her writing life spanned it, you know, earlier than that, of this book's Fear and the Slave Girl, I think that is a genuine attempt to talk about power, um, jealousy, othering, the process of entering the other in that confrontation she sets up with a white, paralyzed, ill mistress and her young, about to be uh, a woman servant. And her response to that is to fabricate some mystical affair that's not taking place between her, this girl and her husband and to invite her own relative down in order to rape and seduce her and to destroy her. It's a, it's a difficult book, it's a problematic book, but this is an instance in which a woman, and the women do it, I think, more easily than the men. Why? I don't know. I think yeah. they're already othered, maybe. Yeah. But when you look at the literature of the women, I mean, I mean Harriet Beecher Stowe, after all, is a woman. So is Catherine, Gertrude Stein, I mean, and Carson McCullers, and reams of others, they are more likely, and, and especially Southern women. It's interesting. Flannery O'Connor, mm -hmm. I mean, Eudora when they Welty. do Eudora Welty, there's something, I, I know this is going to be a great generalization that's <laughs> going to be proven fallacious, but it seems to me in the literature that emerges in which there's a real place for a complicated, either complicated black person or a problematized relationship between a white and a black. Frequently, the people who generate that are women and Unbelievably many of them have lived in the South. That's interesting to me. What, why a different psyche there? I think it's the intimacy. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the intimacy and the distance that is probably, m had been historically much more complicated in the South than in the North, where there was a lot of illusion and delusion and evasion. I mean, you know, you could sort of hide behind very virulent racism for a lot in the North because of the way in which it was constructed. Uh, in the South, it was almost impossible to do that. I don't mean this, this to be a trick question. It just occurs to me, though. <laughs> Is it conceivable that you could write a novel in which blacks are not center stage? Absolutely. You think the public would let you because the expectations are you made such a 
you, you've achieved such fame and made such a contribution by writing about black people in your novel that they now expect you to write about black people. I will, but I won't identify them as such. That's the difference. There are two moments in Beloved in which I tried to do it, which I set up a situation in which two people are talking, two black people, and some other people enter the scene, and they're never identified as black or white. But the reader knows instantly, not because I use the traditional language of stereotype. The two moments, one, when uh, Paul D and Setha are walking down the street, and he touches her shoulder to lead her off of the sidewalk onto the ground because three women are walking this way. And that's all. But you know who that is. It's another moment when he's sort of in despair talking to a friend and a man rides up on a horse and says, where's, I don't know what her name is, Valerie. And he calls a woman by her first name. Doesn't she live around here somewhere? And you can tell by the reactions of the black men that he is a white man. But I don't have to say it. So my thing that I really want to do and expect to do is to do what you say, but I am not writing about white people. I will be writing about black people. But I won't have to do what they did in all these 19th century novels. They always had to say it. I mean, you couldn't say... Jupiter walked in the room, or Mary, you said the Negro, the slave, yeah. the black, the this, you know, it, it always required its own modifier. You take the modifiers out, you see. If you had, Willa Cather had entitled her book, Sephira and Nancy, that changes the whole book. I mean, the uh, strategies are different, the power relationships are different. So, but she said Sephira and the slave girl. She has no first name, you know, in the title. In fact, as you talk, I remember now, back to my own reading in those periods, that you were always called the something. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Was, there was not a name, there was no an, name. an object. That's right. A noun. That's right. The Negro, the That's slave, right. the exactly. Negress. That's yeah. right. Or my. I challenged my students last year if they could find a 19th century novel in which a black male appeared and was called a man without the possessive pronoun or when he was not in the company of a black female in which case they were distinguishing gender just find one reference in which somebody says black man i'll take you to dinner i said <laughs> <laughs> did, did you uh, have to pay out mm -hmm. any not yet you haven't uh -uh. but if i write a book and i can do that Whatever it will mean to the people who read it, they won't be confused. That will be part of my job. But can you think what it would mean for me and my relationship to language and to texts to be able to do that without having to always explain to the reader the race of the characters? Even if in my mind they are all black or African Americans or whatever the word is at the time. If I don't have to say that. From the New York Public Library, this has been a conversation with Toni Morrison. I'm Bill Moyers.